Jeremiah chapter 16. We've been looking at this book of Jeremiah for the last uh, month, month and a half now, off and on. And so, um, looking forward to working our way through it. We're not going verse by verse because Jeremiah is actually a collection of sermons and uh, preached over a number of years. And uh, so, this is not like a narrative that you can work your way through. It's kind of, of uh, you have to have the understanding that these are individual messages that are placed here. But there are some things said in chapter 16 and in chapter 17 that we're going to be looking at today. So um, we're going to be looking at chapter 16 and in the beginning our reading in verse 10. So if you could follow along. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt show this people all these words. And they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we've committed against the Lord our God? Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land, into a land that you know not, neither ye nor your fathers, and there ye shall serve other gods, day and night, where I will not show you favor. Now turn over to Jeremiah chapter 17, and we're going to begin our reading in verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall be careful, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doing. Father, we pray your blessing on our time together. I pray, God, that you might minister through me, from your word, to the hearts of these folks gathered here today. We thank you that uh, we have a God that loves us and that is concerned and cares for us. And we thank you, God, that we can be here today gathered to hear a word from you. So open our understandings and uh, make us tender toward the things that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I've begun a message today with quotes from non-Christians. I rarely do that. I don't make it a practice. But today I want to lead out with two quotes, one from an atheist scientist and the other from a, a pop singer. The scientist is an individual by the name of Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was an American astronomer. He was a very popular science writer. He taught at Cornell University, uh, taught critical thinking at Cornell for several uh, years until his death in 1996. Anyway, the quote that caught my attention by Carl Sagan was this. He said this, human beings have a demonstrated talent for self-deception when their emotions are stirred. Now, I think that that was a pretty profound quote. I would disagree with much of what Carl Sagan wrote and said. However, when I read that sentence, I thought a moment, I said, that is just absolutely true. Human beings have a demonstrated talent for self-deception when their emotions are stirred. The second quote came from a female singer, pop singer, 
by the name of Selena Gomez. And she, she wrote and performed a song called The Heart Wants What It Wants. And that song title was actually taken from a writer by the name of Emily Dickinson who said, the heart wants what it wants, or it else it does not care. <coughs> Gomez's song is about a guy who wants to break up and a girl who does not want to lose him. That's the gist of the song. I'm not going to sing it for you. Okay? Just make, I'll say that. I know you're disappointed. But part of that song is, save your advice, cause I won't hear. You might be right, but I don't care. There's a million reasons why I should give you up, but the heart wants what it wants. The heart wants what it wants. Carl Sagan and Selena Gomez are so different as to be poles apart from one another. But Sagan's observation and these lyrics are very similar. That the heart is deceptive and that acknowledgement of reality does not matter. It only matters what's, what the heart wants. Those two statements dovetail with what we are talking about this morning. And sadly, popular culture reinforces the lyrics of these songs, of this song that she wrote and performed. The advice that many people give is what? Follow your heart. You ever heard somebody say that? You gotta follow your heart. Follow your feelings. Follow your desires. And people in general I'm talking about among society. We'll give you that advice. Well, you gotta follow your heart. You gotta follow where your heart takes you. You have to follow your bliss. Really? You have to? It's mandatory? It's a rule? That's what you gotta do? Oh, I guess I better do it. As we have been in the book of Jeremiah these past few weeks, we, we see recurring themes of judgment. God's judgment upon his people unless they repent. And he's told them that they would be conquered. If they didn't repent, they were going to be conquered and carted off to a foreign land where they would be in exile. Now some of these, as you read through the book of Jeremiah, some of these pronouncements of judgment are, are pretty graphic. I mean, he tells them at one point that their bodies were going to lay in the street and eaten by dogs. And at another point he says, you're going to lay, your body's going to lay in the street and, and they're not going to be buried because there's nobody going to be around to bury you. That's, that's, <laughs> that's fairly graphic. It's also going to be true. But for the most part, that message fell on deaf ears. The people ignored God's prophet, Jeremiah, in a large measure because they had done what is currently being done in our generation. They were listening to their heart. Now these two passages of Scripture, we're going to, we're going to unpack them a bit this morning for us. And, but I want you to see that in the beginning of our reading, there is an inquiry that God says is going to be made. He is telling Jeremiah, the people are going to ask this question. So there's an inquiry going to be made about the cause of judgment. And it's a clueless in inquiry. Absolutely clueless. He says here, it's going to come to pass, Jeremiah, when you show the people all of these words that are going to be judged and carted off to exile, they're going to say or ask, wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this evil? What iniquity have we done? What's the sin we've committed that's so bad that God's going to do this? What have we done? God is telling Jeremiah, he's going to be telling them over and over again what their sin is, and we've already talked about somewhat in this study what their sin was. 
But they're going to turn around and ask this clueless question, what do we do so bad? What do we do wrong? Where's it? What's our sin that God would do this to us? So cluelessness is going to be the order of the day. And then Jeremiah is told, when they ask this question, they are to be answered, and verse 11 is, is the summary of this, there's a very conclusive indictment here. He is to tell them there has been a historical pattern of disobedience. Verse 11. Then you'll say to them, because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and I've walked after other gods and have served them and have worshipped them and have forsaken me and have not kept my law. That's a historical condemnation. That has been the pattern for decades for, for Israel at this point in history. But that's not the issue at hand right now. That had been, this message had been declared by not only Jeremiah but others for years. But now judgment was imminent. It was coming very quickly. And it's because of what is contained in verse 12. This is the current, the current sin, the current egregious defiance of these people. Verse 12, and ye have done, what's the word? Worse than your fathers. Now what could be worse than this beast? For behold, ye walk everyone after the imagination of his evil heart, that you will not even listen, that they may not hearken. Now we're going to come back to that point in, in just a few minutes. But that's the egregious defiance that the current generation to whom Jeremiah was talking wasn't simply disobedience. It was walking after the imaginations of their heart. And therefore, verse 13, will I cast you out of this land. That's why. So three things were going to happen. They were going to be exiled to a foreign land. They were going to be in spiritual bondage to false gods. Note what it says there, verse 13. Neither uh, you will serve other gods day and night. So you're not going to be worshiping me at all. By the way, that was part of the judgment, that they were going to be given over to falsehood and idolatry, and that God would no longer bless them. He says in verse 13, 13, I will not show you favor. Estrangement from God and his blessings. So very simply put, the prophet Jeremiah, in answer to this clueless question, tells them that the reason God is judging them is because of their long-standing history of rebellion. But now this judgment was going to consummate due to something that had provoked him beyond the point of restoration, and that was the deciding factor. The deciding factor. It was imminent. And this is where I want to park a few minutes. Because he says, you have been walking after the imagination of an evil heart. Now, the concept of the heart in the Bible is complex. We're not talking necessarily simply about emotions when we're talking about the heart. Sometimes in our, in our day, when we talk about, well, the heart, you know, not the physical component, obviously, I'm not talking about that. But the heart is often just emotions. It's often referred to as that, as that. But in Bible days, it was more than that. It included the emotions. But it also included the mind and the will. So there's volition and there's emotion and there's an intellectual component with the element of the heart in the Old Testament especially, but all through the scripture. Mind, will, and emotions. The heart is emotional. It's talked about in emotional terms in the scripture. Psalm 27 verse 3, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Indicating fear comes from the heart. Deuteronomy chapter 28 indicates that it's also the place where you experience heaviness or despair. And among the nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart. In the Old Testament, there is an individual by the name of Nehemiah who ended up leading his people back to the promised land. 
but he was served in the king's house in the, in the palace in Babylon, and he was disturbed and upset about the fact that his people were captive. And one of the observations that the king said in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. So what the Bible is acknowledging here is that the heart is a place of emotion. It's a place where anger takes place. Psalm 39.3 says, My heart was hot within me. Yeah, the anger. So the heart is emotional. The heart is also volitional. It has a matter, it ma makes decisions in the matter of the will, of where, what you're going to do and how you're going to order your life. Psalm 112, 7 says, he, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He's made the decision that he's going to trust the Lord. His, he's made a volitional decision. That's kind of like that, isn't it? But the idea is, is that he has made the decision. Ecclesiastes 1.13 says, I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done unto him. There's the element of making a decision. And then the heart is spiritual as well. Uh, Psalm 9 verse 1. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. It's where worship is. It's where interaction with God takes place. It's where rebellion comes from against God. Psalm 10, 13 says, where doth, Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God or contend with God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require. It's a heart decision that he is going to rebel against God. So, it is a complex thing in Scripture. And sometimes you can be a little bit confused. Oh, well, I thought hearts were, yeah, the heart was all about emotion. No, it's not. The inner sanctum of the heart is complex. The inner sanctum of the heart is critical as well. It's critical. Hence, the, hence this, what the scripture says today. You've not just disobeyed. That's what your ancestors did all of this time. You have done something even worse. Walked according to the imaginations of your heart. Verse 12 of chapter 16. That word imagination comes from a Hebrew word meaning twisted. Now picture this. You picture a cloth that's very soft. And you're holding it in your hand. And it's very soft. Maybe it's a very soft towel. And it really feels good to the touch. But then you take that towel and you start twisting it and you get it as tight as you possibly can, it loses what it once had, right? And now it's tight. Now it's hard. That is the Hebrew word that is used here, meaning twisted. And the idea is that they have become set and stubborn and rebellion against being, rebellious against being told anything. It won't listen. Verse 12 your heart has become twisted that they may not hearken unto me. Hence, save your advice, because I won't hear. You might be right, but I don't care. There's a million reasons why I should give you up, but the heart wants what it wants. Do you see the parallel in the thinking here? Twisted. That they will not hearken. They won't listen. If the mind, will, and emotions lean a certain way, that is what it's going to embrace. And he says, you have an evil heart that is twisted heart. Your ancestors did bad, but you did worse. They disobeyed, but at least they knew they were disobeying. You follow the imaginations of your heart. Your Israelite forebears knew what God had said and disobeyed him. You don't even acknowledge it. You follow your heart. You listen to your heart. You just follow your own way, your desires, your feelings, and give no thought at all to what God says. You are the authority. The word of God means nothing. The word of you means everything. Think of it. God's people had reached a place of doing something worse than disobeying God 
They have reached a place of substituting the imaginations of their evil heart to the point that they did not feel any need to listen to anything God had to say. <laughs> they were ignoring God. Their forebears knew what God had said and disregarded it. They chose to be ignorant of what God said and following their own ideas and inclinations. Self-sovereignty. I was reading an article this past week uh, by a writer by the name of Andre Sue and she observed that in previous years, the, uh, in Western society anyway, they, would, they were admonished to examine your heart, to search your heart. But in our modern generation, people are urged to follow their heart. This is where Israel had come to. This is why judgment was imminent. It was the deciding factor of current judgment. Now, I want us to turn to Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Look there. And the reason I'm, I'm doing this jumping from chapter to chapter is because there is a connection between the idea of the heart in both chapters. Notice what it says in verse 9. The heart is what? Deceit. And desperately wicked. Who can know? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought through those three ideas that are late in verse 9, but what he is saying is that the heart is an unreliable guide. The heart is deceitful. The idea there is that it is not going to be honest. It won't be honest about where it leads you, because it was going to lead Israel to a place of exile and a place of, of judgment. Do you ever have somebody, do you ever have somebody say to you, I would have never believed that I would reach the place in my life that I have right now? Um, and who would have thought that I would end up here? I've had people say that to me. Who would have thought? I never would have believed that this is where I would end up. The heart is an unreliable guide. It will lead you, it can lead you to a tragic place. They would have never imagined such a place as Babylon. But they did so because they were just following their hearts. Their emotions confirmed the directions they were taking, but it was the wrong direction. You know, people, people act on impulse these days in society. They, they make emotional decisions. They, they make decisions about going into debt based on emotion. They make decisions on relationships totally on emotion. And, and at the time, they feel so sure. I was just certain. It was a young high school student. Year, this is years ago at the West Bloomfield, I believe, in the Detroit area, that got involved in a, in a fight at school, and it wasn't even his fight. It's not, he, but he got involved, and he hit a kid, and the kid fell and hit his head on a curb, I believe. And when the, the kid went to the hospital and eventually died. And that young man, who acted on impulse in the spur of the moment, has been, had been charged with murder. an emotionally thoughtless decision. I was reading several articles um, online of people who were experiencing um, what, has, what is being termed these days as gender dysphoria. And many of them had surgeries to transform themselves into the opposite sex. And the majority of the articles I was reading were that they were now experiencing regret at the decision. Initially, after the surgery had happened, they, for within you know, a year, they would say, well, things are better now. But over time, over the long term, over five, ten years, they began to think, I have made this horrendous mistake. Only now they live with the scars of the decision that they made of the heart. They listen to a deceptive heart. One, one writer after examining like hundreds of these cases, he said a 
the quote of the article was a tidal wave of regret. A tidal wave. The heart is an unreliable guide. It can lead you to a tragic place. It can lead you to make thoughtless decisions. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. There was a Buddhist monk who felt he should have the other monks kick him down a flight of like 250 stairs. So, you know, he'd roll a little bit like, and, and they would like give him another shove and kick him and he would fall 250 stairs. And after it was all over, he, he said he felt a great sense of peace. My question is, did his feelings prove anything of how dumb a thing that is? And the answer to the question is no. People get in trouble, make thoughtless decisions. What if, what if your heart is telling you to harm yourself or someone else? And I'm not talking about hearing voices. I'm just saying, you just, you know, have these feelings and emotions. What if you're feeling jealous or angry? What, what then? Is it acceptable to act on those feelings? The world say, follow your heart. What about the guy that is married and has two or three children? He has promised his wife till death to his part, and he would love her and be true to her. He's a father, but then he feels attracted to a guy. And the world says you've got to be true to your feelings and emotions. If you're not doing that, then you're not being true to yourself. After all, being true to yourself is the supreme important thing according to the world. So leave your wife, leave your kids, follow your feelings. That's what the world says we should do. That is what many people have done. And they leave broken hearts and destroyed lives in their wake. But nothing matters, right? Only to be true to your heart. What if you feel depressed or sad? What if you feel like you just feel bad? What if you feel like a loser? You know, there's, there have been some days, man, what a loser. It's felt what if you have a feeling? What does that mean? It's not reality. God says that you're a person of worth and you're made in his image and, and, and you belong to him and there's value by virtue of the very fact that God loves you and, and he is worth in your life. But hey, you got to follow your heart, right? Does it possess someone else's stuff? Is it okay to, make, to take their stuff if it makes you feel better? okay to follow your feelings and emotions. I met a guy in Holman State Prison. I was not there as a resident. I was there as a visitor. Okay, just clearing that up. Holman State Prison is in Atmore, Alabama. I met a guy, an inmate there, he told me that he got drunk one night and that he molested his granddaughter. He said, I don't remember doing any of that. They told me that that's what I did. I did get drunk and they told me that that's what I did. And if I did that, I deserve to be here. That's what he said. Almost word for word. If I did that, I deserve to be here, but I don't have any memory of doing that. But I will say this. He did feel like alcohol was going to be something that was going to help him and be the answer to his problem. So he did follow his feelings when he did that, followed his thoughts and his mind, his heart. And then when all of those inhibitions were broken down, he followed through with another feeling, a perverted feeling. He was following his heart. The, the heart can lead you to make thoughtless decisions. The heart can lead you into falsehood. You know, part of the judgment of God was that they were going to be locked into falsehood and worshiping false gods. He says, you're going to go to another country that you would not want to go to, neither your fathers, and you are going to day and night worship other gods. That was part of the judgment. The heart can lead into falsehood. I, you realize that, that faith in Christ is not an emotional it's not an emotionally based or mystical, mystically based faith. 
it is evidentiary. When the apostles went out preaching the word, they didn't say, believe in Jesus because you are going to be like hyped up, buddy. You're going to have great, wonderful emotions. They didn't say that. They said, believe in Jesus because this is what he did on the cross for you, and he proved it by rising from the dead. He proved it. There's evidence. One guy, one guy chose a, a church because they had a very exciting atmosphere and, they, and people were very pumped up. And he said, I wouldn't trade this feeling for a stack of Bibles. You know what? Follow me. Follow me by heart. There is one potential, there's one cult that tells potential converts to pray to know the truth and that God would give them a burning within the bosom. Their words, not mine. That they would experience this, this feeling. And then if it came, if they cause feelings to come and go, but if it came, that was confirmation. That is baloney. And sometimes, folks, I think we, we do that. I had the privilege of, as it's not in my notes, this is free. Um, I was reminded about it in the last session. I led a guy to Christ one day in my office in Hazel Park, and we spent some time in the Word, and I explained to him how Jesus died on the cross to be his substitute, took all his penalty upon himself, and if he had, would believe on Christ, that he would be given everlasting life. And, and he, he very, very sincerely accepted Christ as his Savior. And uh, we walked out of my office, and there was a, there was a, a guy in the next office doing some work in there, and he's up in the ministry, he's a guy in the ministry. And so I thought, well, we need to go tell this guy. And so we walked into the office, and I introduced him to, to the guy I just led to Christ, and I said, I said, such and such just received, Mark just received Christ as his Savior. And you know the first question that my ministerial friend asked him? He said, how do you feel? And my friend Mark, who had just accepted Christ as Savior, didn't know he was supposed to feel anything. He said to my ministerial colleague, he said, well, I could really use a Tums right now. <laughs> <laughs> I could really use a Tums. That's why I got a little bit of indigestion going on. <laughs> it's not about how we feel. It's about what is true. It's not about what we want, it's about what is true. The heart is an unreliable guide. The heart is a contaminated place. Verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and what? Desperately wicked. Desperately. It is not naturally good. There is a magnetism in all of us toward that which is it's like the old song, and we sang a song similar to it this morning, but the old song, Prone to Wander, Lord. I feel it. Prone to Wander. There's a magnetism that all of us need to acknowledge that goes in a direction that we, that is not wholesome and it's not good, it's not going, it's not holy. Psalm 858.2 says, Yea, in heart ye work wickedness, ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You don't have to teach children to lie. No, you don't. They will do it naturally. They'll deceive you. Someone, it's like someone said, if, if little babies had adult bodies and coordination, there would be a lot more murders. <laughs> go for it. An unregenerate person has an unenlightened heart. You know, there's no more graphic description of the heart than in Romans chapter 3. You read that. It is uh, between 9 and the end of the chapter, verse 9 of Romans 3. He says in verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. There's, they're all gone out of the way. They're all become unprofitable. There's none that do it good. No, not one. And then the rest of the chapter is... It's not, it doesn't speak glowingly of, of humanity. 
The heart is a contaminated place, and furthermore, it is an unknowable entity. Notice what it says there. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? We think we know sometimes. Arrogantly, we think we, we've got all the answers. That is unsafe mankind. They have all the answers. I mean, how many of you have gone to a doctor and you tell him your symptoms? Yeah, you, know, you just tell him, well, you know, I've got this and I've got that going on, I've got this going on. He says, oh, and then you say, I think I have got strep throat. And he says, oh, okay, well, let me read you out the scripture. Strep throat? Are you the one that diagnoses? Or does he take a coach? Or does he, you know, does he examine you? Does he just take your word for it? You think you know. Okay, you know. No, he, he looks at you. He looks in your ears. He looks in your mouth. He looks in your throat. He asks you questions. And then he kind of turns around and says, you know, you're throat. You've got this. But the fact is, many people can't be told, even by, even by people who know better, they can't be told. Why? Because they already know it. Who can know it? The fact is that the heart is such that you cannot trust it. I don't know how many times I have heard of family dogs that people in the family would swear this dog would not hurt a flea that was biting it. And then that same family dog turns on, on a child. In, in a moment, maybe the child falls on the dog, or the dog is frightened. But the animal nature of the dog takes over, and they respond. I, and I said, we have, we've had pets all through the years. And I said, listen, no matter what else they may be, they're still animals. Yep. They have an animal nature. And, and given the right circumstances, they may respond in an unpredictable way. We have a nature as well. The heart has a nature. And it has such a nature that no one can fully trust it. Sometimes kids will say to their parents, don't you trust me? And when I had, Cindy and I had things, similar things said like that to us, I would say, no, I don't trust me. Why would I trust you? I wouldn't trust myself in certain circumstances. Why? Because I've got an old nature just like anybody else does. There was an evangelist, and I've shared this with you before, but some of you have been around here. You know, I've been around a while, you've been around a while. But one evangelist who said, flesh is flesh no matter whose bones it's stretched over. And, and the guy would be up there and he said, now I want everybody to do this. He said, take, take some of this and just, just kind of wiggle it around so everybody would do that. You feel foolish. You've got a whole student body doing this. He said, now I want you to feel this. And know that flesh is flesh, no matter whose bones it's stretched over. All made of the same stuff. The heart is such that no one can fully trust it. Now, what's the deliverance? Very quickly, those, the deliverance of those captive to the heart. And it is in also in Jeremiah chapter 5. Those who have a trust relationship with God, that's, that is deliverance. One should not trust man, including yourself. Look at verse 5 of Jeremiah 17. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh, his, maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. He's going to be like the heath in the desert. He'll inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. But blessings come by trusting in the Lord. Look at verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth, trusts in the Lord, and in whose hope the Lord is, for he is as a tree planted by the waters, spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be worried or careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. fruit. What does that verse remind you of? Psalm reminds me of Psalm 1-1. Psalm 1. Yeah. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate in night, and he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. 
Know that blessing and fruitfulness and fulfillment in life come only by knowing and walking with the Lord. It does not come by following the imaginations of the heart. It comes from listening to and integrating with God's Word. It is true that the heart wants what it wants, but the heart does not know what it needs. The heart is the heart needs a personal relationship with God through being forgiven of one's sin in Christ and integrating his word in our minds and will and emotions. Don't trust your heart, my friend. Trust Christ. You need to know the one, to trust the one who knows your heart. The heart is deceitful, verse 9 says, above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, verse 10, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. You know, that is the major deal right there. It is the matter of the heart. God's people were judged in part because of their history of disobedience, but the judgment was coming because of people who had done worse, and that was follow the imaginations of their heart. Follow my heart? No thank you. No thank you. I want God's purposes. I want God's thoughts. Permeating me. I want his presence. Trust my heart? I don't trust my heart. I've made too many really foolish decisions to do that. I want God's word integrated into my heart. I want God's presence present in my mind, will, and emotions. David, the psalmist, and I'll close with this. David, the psalmist, as a, as, at, a, at a time of life when he was walking close to God, because he didn't always. But at a time of life when he was walking close to God, <coughs> he said, and it's recorded in Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. Have you ever prayed that sincerely? And I'm talking about mind, will, and emotions. Because this, friend, is really the crucial area of life. You can have, you can walk according to the twistedness, the hardness of your heart. Or you can have the softness towards God and say, and invite him and say, God. I want you here. I'm, I'm throwing the door open to you and say, this is what, you are the one I want working within, my, within me. I want your presence. I want your thoughts within me. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know. Heavenly Father, we have uh, seen what you have said about the heart and the inner sanctum. And I pray that if there's anyone here that has never invited Jesus into their heart, that have never trusted him and turned to him, in repentance and faith, I pray, Lord, that you would impress upon them the urgency of acknowledging Christ as Savior and Lord and inviting him to reside with them. Father, you have said that you are nigh those that are of a broken heart and saveth such that are of a contrite spirit. 
you have said that you were with him that is of a humble spirit in order to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of a contrite. So Father, we know that anyone who comes to you can't come to you, cannot come to you in arrogance, cannot come to you in pride and with a disposition that they know all and that they are, their opinion is supreme. Things come to you with the idea that you are the one who knows them better than anyone. You know how flawed and sinful we are and you love us still. And you know how needy we are. And you have designed to meet those needs. And, and only you can do that. So Father, in the quietness of the heart today, of each one of us, I pray for anyone that doesn't know the Savior, that in this time of quietness, that they might even, even address you right now and tell you, admit to you, I know that I'm a sinner, I know what I deserve, I know Jesus died in my place and arose from me and trust him in him alone. And help those who profess Christ to realize that following the heart can be a very dangerous way. Help them to realize they need you to search saturate their heart with your word. Bless now during this time of invitation we pray in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, can we stand just for a few moments? I think we have a few minutes this morning. So, um, just in the quietness, because we're doing God right